fantastic group of people to help us think about this from very many different angles on the ground, external. Um, uh, and, and so I'll very briefly introduce them since you have their bios. Uh, and then we'll just get right underway with some questions. So Howard Buffett, uh, uh, I'm delighted to see you here today, uh, is a research scholar and, and professor at SEPA. So I want to say that first. He also serves on numerous corporate boards, but he works on projects in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Africa. He has in the course of his life, as well as been an advisor uh, and worked on advisory committees, very high level ones to the president and the US government. So thank you, Howard, uh, for being with us. And he's the author of a, of a very important, successful book, which I th think he'll speak to a, a little bit. We also have uh, Liam Forum, who I know is joining us from Aus Australia, who's the co-chair and co-founder of the Peace Dividend Initiative, which is a humanitarian and business incubator uh, it, and he's also worked on humanitarian dialogue. So thank you for being with us. Uh, we also have Mo Ibrahim, uh, who's an extraordinary uh, entrepreneur and business leader, who's created a world famous philanthropy uh, focused on governance in Africa and many businesses. So Mo, I think you're joining us today from Europe and very grateful uh, to have you with us. Uh, and Achim Weinbaum, who's advisor to the director of the Geneva Institute, one of our uh, close partner schools, and former coordinator of the Geneva Peace Building Platform. So all of, of these individuals have been so involved. And of course, we also have with us the director of uh, the program, Jean-Marie Gaino, uh, who uh, has designed this great week and may join us uh, as well in conversation at a certain point, if motivated and Mutar Kent, uh, who, uh, as you know, has been the person who really inaugurated this idea uh, of bringing together different uh, interests around uh, the question of conflict resolution, whether governmental or private sector, and saw the importance as a corporate leader in his life as a chairman CEO, but also uh, more recently in working with us, uh, the value of continuing uh, this effort. So delighted that Mutar is with us throughout this week. Uh, the main issues we are really facing in Africa, I can summarize them in, in uh, just few, few, few main issues. Uh, first thing is, is, is demography, uh, which is two-edged sword. We have a tsunami of young people, uh, which means every year we need to find 15 to 20 million jobs. Now, where do jobs come from? Jobs come from investment. And uh, what the investment investors uh, are looking for? A uh, few things, of course, they look for uh, rule of law, uh, lack of red tape, transparency, and also market size. Uh, we think for Africa to succeed, we really need to implement and enhance uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Because we cannot be 54 uh, small markets. That is not really a, a great uh, story to tell investors. Some of our countries are really very, very small. And still, we have these borders uh, uh, and, 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 and the complications. Of uh, we need freedom of movement of goods, people, capital, etc., across our borders. We are moving in that direction, but I wish we would move uh, uh, faster. Uh, the challenge also is the in the area of infrastructure and energy. Energy is the most pressing problem we have. And uh, 400 to 500 million Africans uh, don't have access to electricity today. This, that take 450 million people from the really uh, uh, potential of, of a highly productive uh, mm -hmm. uh, economic force, unfortunately. And uh, with 
uh, I work with uh, what we call the, the, the Council on Fragile States, uh, which was formed a couple of years ago. Uh, was It was an, issue, an initiative by, by the uh, International Growth Center, which is based in the London School of Economics, together with Oxford uh, Blackrick School of Governance. And uh, then they we had a number of people, uh, interesting people, from business people like Tijani Siam to leaders like uh, Sir Leaf, uh, Madame Sir Leaf, uh, uh, David Cameron also, people like Abruka. So we had a, a mixture of different people. And also had uh, leaders from fragile states. So we had the Prime Minister of Sudan, we had the Prime Minister of Yemen, and to really discuss the issue of fragility. And uh, we issued a call for action a couple of months ago. Uh, the main points actually uh, uh, we raised in our call was scaling energy access is the most important and easy win we can achieve to stabilize fragile societies. And that's a key component uh, for resilient recovery and uh, to create condition really for sustainable peace and to build stability. And we also called for the adoption of distributed uh, uh, renewal, uh, renewable energy systems uh, in these fragile states. Uh, the, argument, the, the argument there is straightforward. Uh, you look at the expanse of Africa and the size of the rural areas. Uh, it is it's not practical to think of central grids uh, extending thousands of miles across a continent, uh, which is susceptible anyway to, to, to uh, uh, terrorist attacks, etc. And uh, it's very expensive, very expensive. Uh, what we think really is that uh, uh, we can drop on off-grid uh, uh, this solar systems or whatever, uh, which now becoming cost-effective. And this can be a very quick solution uh, because we need to have quick wins to help improve the lives of people, to give them a little bit of hope uh, uh, to get out of this stressful situation. Uh, in order to do that, we need also to look at a new and innovative financing and business models uh, because business need to get involved in that and business needs support because this will be deployed uh, in what is essentially unstable areas. And uh, we offered a number of uh, various options of how that could be done, uh, uh, how can we mix. Uh, we don't like the idea of, of taking the first loss, that the public money take the first loss, we think is not, is not right. Uh, we think of uh, equity participation, but accepting a low uh, return and enhancing the, the, the return of the private sector, uh, or uh, cheap loans, preferably in local currency. Uh, you, know, you know, various actions to help de-risk the investment and entice the business to, to come there. Other actions also, of course, is needed is to try to build the state capacity and to get the locals also involved in what is being done. So it doesn't look like an important solutions. Yes, certainly. And, and thank you very much for, for having me on the panel, Dean Geno. Um, I think my comments will reflect very much what Dr. Ibrahim and, and Howard have said, is that, you know, we found um, through our work that there is entre entrepreneurial spirit everywhere. And one of the big challenges that we've seen is a real disconnect between um, the entrepreneurs in, in even some of the most 
sort of uh, conflict affected and fragile situations, and then the capital markets and support, which aren't reaching them. So that's sort of where we where we began this this peace dividend initiative um, journey was working at, as you say, the Centre for Humanitarian Dialogue. For for those who don't know it, it's uh, it's a leading private diplomacy organisation based in in Geneva, Switzerland, and it works in about thirty countries around the world in a very discreet back channel manner manner to um, to build peace agreements essentially. And you know it works uh, for many years um, discreetly, working with political actors uh, to pull together these peace agreements. And and what we learned um, in many of the places where we worked that when a peace agreement was signed, um, often there was a lack of of rapid economic growth that would that would arrive quickly. And what would what that would mean was there was a real danger of those sort of conflict and fragile areas slipping back into conflict and war because the jobs and the livelihoods just just weren't arriving fast enough which is is surprising in a way because there's a you know a huge international architecture and and system in place to be able to support those entrepreneurs um, and to be, to try and channel capital there but you know there remains a real disconnect between that huge you know both public and private effort to to build jobs and support livelihoods. Um, and that's where we really have stepped in and tried to build a mechanism that better connects um, entrepreneurs and, and appetite for jobs and, and business creation. And I, I think it would, it's, it's really interesting to hear Howard's, you know, sort of principles on, on how you run successful, um, you know, enterprises, they resonate a lot with a, a piece of work that we're doing with um, um, with some academics, in, including Dr. Wenman, who's on the, the panel today, which is really looking at a set of metrics of how you can actually make businesses uh, profitable, but also peace supporting. We're calling them ESG plus P. But one of the, one of the challenges in these fragile in, environments is you do get capital and you do get um, you know, support for, for some of the economic development, but it can often be unscrupulous actors or there isn't the, the real follow through to ensure that those investments uh, are actually, you know, sustainable and inclusive and, and are actually peace supporting, are actually going to lock in peace over the, the medium to long term. So I guess that's a, that's a short way of saying I, I very much um, agree with what Dr. Ibrahim and and, and how it have said, and that's what we found uh, through field work over the last um, two years that we've been building this initiative. Um, I might pause briefly and just, just give a little anecdote on, on how quickly this can be turned around. Um, we've been working in Colombia with the, um, the, the reintegrating FARC and particularly on the economic reintegration of their, um, of the 14,000 odd, Odd members that have been through the peace process. And we engage with them on, they have about 250 business models in various different, um, uh, you know, states of maturity. Um, but, you know, they cover everything from agriculture to manufacturing to digital to tourism. And they were really struggling to find both the guidance and support and also the capital uh, to be able to turn those businesses into reality. We picked a couple just to pilot to see how this would work. Um, and we built two businesses, a fashion business, which exports through London into, into Europe and a chocolate business. And um, it was done relatively quickly. And I think one of the big changes in the last say five years are these digital tools. And by that, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of this work gets done over WhatsApp. So, and, and various other sort of digital mediums where you can reach and communicate from a, from a fashion house in London or Paris, right into, you know, sort of from some fairly rural parts and fragile parts of Colombia, you can actually design a product, deal with the logistics, um, manage the funding requirements, train, you know, the, the various parts of the, the value chain and have a product ready in six to 12 months. So it can be done, and I think it is the evolution of those digital connectivity skills um, that have really allowed you know, us uh, to build those, 
those businesses. Um, I won't say too much more, but one of the questions that I think both Doc Debroom and, and how to have touched on and what we're working on currently is really scaling the impact. And we're, we're putting together some blended finance mechanisms to back both at the venture level and, and more at medium um, ticket size to, to really get out and manage the risk to get into these more fragile and conflict affected countries. Absolutely. Thank you very much uh, for, for being part of the panel. And uh, of course, it is to the academic to find all the solutions, I, I, I presume. So um, let, me, let me not try to do that, but uh, let me just perhaps share a few re reflections of, of the work which I've done over the last 10, 10 15 years. Um, I think the, what comes out of the field research that many of, of uh, the researchers of the Graduate Institute, but also many of those who are working on the, in, in organizations like the Center of Humanitarian Dialogue uh, find is just the degree of complexity that investments finds once they hit the ground. Um, and I think unpacking and demystifying how places really work, how this complex environment really unfolds is the first entry point um, for, for in fact connecting to place. Um, now here, in, in various um, advisor positions that I had two peace processes myself, including to Yemen recently, there's one thing that comes always back, is that during the times of war, economies are locked up. They are like, imagine these big fat padlocks on the economy that, um, um, uh, that represent monopolistic interests and that are extremely difficult to get away with. Uh, so in the case of Yemen, um, there are possibly 20 to 30 big padlocks that have to be slowly opened or not so slowly, but that also involve a degree of mix of not just investment, but also clever diplomacy and sometimes some power to open these up. And this is, I think, exactly uh, where the, 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 the triangulation is working, that none of the actors can unlock the economies during or after conflicts by themselves. And hence the emphasis on, 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 uh, on co-production of uh, functioning markets, co-production of opportunities, uh, where you have uh, power, incentives, and also capital work all, all, all in hand. Um, the other thing that Lee mentioned and that all of you mentioned is there is this tremendous capability and, and energy there but very often it exists in, 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 in uncoordinated ways. It just exists and then the effect just, just, just plops away. And here there is really a very, very big opportunity to come in and, and try to coordinate the, the energies which are there, like what the PDI does to connect from the very ground up to the, to the capital markets in London. That is a, a gap uh, that uh, currently is there and that, uh, that um, can be solved relatively quickly due to the digital connectivity. Um, but beyond the, uh, the, um, the kind of element of bringing together the, or understanding the complexity, um, I think what my research, but also the, the practice uh, of many peace mediating actors that I've been engaged with when running one of uh, Europe's biggest peace building network, the Geneva Peace Building Platform, is that investments are not accompanied for long enough because there are investments that go in into some difficult places, but then uh, there is really no, no accompaniment mechanisms or, or, or like nurturing uh, actors who help this environment really to, to come to fruition. Um, partly because uh, some, some actors don't have the time horizon that is long enough, but also the change is just too quickly. Um, so hence, um, what, what we, I've worked on over the last five years is really to connect peace building know-how and mediation know-how, how, how one can really diffuse tensions and environments um, from very localized environments to Syria, to Yemen, to also some of the most violent cities in the world uh, in order to have a company mechanisms that are really sticking um, to the investment projects for about 10 years or so. Um, and these are the, 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 the mechanisms that are necessary, partly because states simply do not function or do not work in the way they, they, they should, but one cannot wait until the moment that they do. 
So there needs to be an intermediate uh, actor and process in order to, to have this accompaniment uh, functions being delivered uh, while states uh, or other, other actors uh, are coming up to speed. Now, I want to connect to one thing which has been coming back, which is the issue of, of scaling. Because only a small little type of investments here and there um, is really, um, it doesn't really come up to speed. And also for, for, for there are a lot of uh, very hard-headed negative actors who are coming in these areas in order to, uh, to, uh, to make quick money and, and basically to, to make. You know, the first investors who move into fragile states uh, are almost, almost all unscrupulous people. Mm -hmm. Really, it's criminals. The first guys to move in there, they are risk takers and their approaches are just incredible. And anyway, also, uh, many of those people uh, do fund actually some of the combatants or the, some of the warlords, etc., and they treat that as an investment in those guys when they come to power, then means lucrative contracts will come to them. We see that happening all the time in Africa. Bribery is, is an essential tool for those people. And we need to really crowd those people out of that space. And we can only do that by going in quickly uh, with reasonable structures. And we talked a lot about blended finance, about the risking, about the, but we want to see some formulas approved for, to enable uh, uh, managers in this institution to act quickly. And this is a problem. We are very slow in, 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 in acting. And uh, I don't know, really, uh, how can we speed this? And uh, this is a conversation we continue to have with those people. And we need to see also more international cooperation. The problem at the moment, everybody is interested in planting their flag. This is my Norwegian operation. Oh, this is my British thing there. We say, guys, you work together. And if you are work good at sanitation, okay. All our funding for sanitation, we, you manage it. You good at health, we, we, we all come to you and you lead on health. That's how, how people should cooperate. Instead of just, uh, you know, uh, trying to get the uh, bips or flags uh, uh, there. So we need this kind of conversation, really. Yeah. And to emphasize, we need to act together somehow. We need, we need to have a better mode of operation, which is more quickly and act. So much, uh, of course. So um, there are many, many, many stories. And um, perhaps I just relate uh, one or two of them. Um, one relates to, uh, to, uh, to a project in, in the Middle East. Uh, I can't be more specific, unfortunately, but it's, it's, it's about understanding that an investment in a difficult context needs to manage its relations with the environment, the social and political environment in which it invests in one way or the other. So the company itself can't necessarily do it because the, the, the actors that are in this environment are, have all sorts of labels from, uh, from, from rebel groups to corrupt politicians to all sorts of labels which are there. So there is, a, is an accompanying mechanism necessary to, to moderate and mediate this relation between the company investment and the political, uh, the political um, system that surrounds the investment. Now, what is important here is that as the investment goes forward, um, the, this process management, uh, in fact, on the one hand, protects the investment, but also works on the perceptions of these political actors in the system about the investments. And within this one year process, which I've seen, there was quite some understanding that, okay, this investment, we don't touch. Uh, this investment that creates a lot of benefits to my followers, to, to individuals across the conflict lines. And this is why this process managed to create a certain safe space. So this is one in a, in a relatively volatile en en environment. Um, another one is, um, again, coming to the, perhaps the, an example of a more large scale mining type investment. This, in this case, this was in, in, in West Africa. 
where any large scale investment is like a, like a bomb that lands in an environment where everything changes because all the incentive structures change, their ripples going through a, a, a society. And it requires a lot of conflict mitigation and, and conflict management. So in this context, um, there, there were dispute resolution systems associated to the investment that try to absorb some of the, some of the shocks uh, to the communities uh, with this investment. Now, sometimes it worked well, but of course not all of the shocks could be absorbed because they were overpowering the accompaniment mechanisms because the pressures created were too big, um, which is also a very important lesson, I think, on the accompaniment mechanisms that the mechanism needs to be appropriate uh, for the type of investment that is created. Um, so much. These are wonderful remarks and great, great insights from experience. Um, this is only day two. Let me invite Jean-Marie to uh, talk to us about the rest of the week. I hope to have all of you involved with us in the future. We have so much to learn from you. I've learned so much 